Welcome to our presentation on performing efficient and effective constructability reviews. My name is Jason Smith and I'll be orchestrating this training. This lesson has been designed to provide you with a good understanding of where to start, how to go about the process of a constructability review, and, very importantly, how to manage the process. There are many learning objectives to this training, but let me quickly highlight the top five. When looking at the sometimes intimidatingly large stack of drawings and specifications, the first question that pops into many people's minds is, wow, where do I start? By the end of this training, you will have the answer to this question. Different things work for different people, so I won't force my own personal methodologies on you. On the contrary, I will provide you with the knowledge and various options for you to develop your own personal style for going about a constructability review. During the early stages of the design, constructability reviews should not be long lists of items that are just simply not done yet. In this training, you will learn the appropriate level of detail for preliminary reviews. When the constructability review is handed over to the design team, the process is still not over. In this training, you will learn how to manage the process to ensure that all of the constructability review comments are appropriately addressed by the design team. The review process does not need to focus solely on design issues. Near the end of this training, I'm going to teach you eight very important additional benefits that we can gain from this process. All right, let's jump into the training. Now, I'd like to start by clarifying that a constructability review is a process that doesn't end when the comments are presented to the design team. The review process includes working with the design team to develop solutions to the problems, incorporating the solutions into the design documents, and management of the review comments to ensure that they are all incorporated into the drawings and specs. Okay, we have a lot to cover here, so let me lay out the game plan for this training. First, we'll talk briefly about what documents, beyond the drawings and specifications, that we need to include in the review. Next, we'll discuss the two predominant methods of going about a constructability review. We'll also discuss the phases of a review. Specifically, what we need to focus on, and what level of detail we should get into at each design milestone. The bulk of this presentation will be an in-depth discussion of the top five rules for an efficient and effective constructability review. We'll then discuss how to organize the review comments. As mentioned, I'll also run through the additional benefits of a constructability review that can be taken easy advantage of. Then I'll show you an example of how I personally organize and present a review. And finally, we'll address the top five barriers to completing a thorough constructability review. Okay, let's start with the absolute basics of what documents we need to review. Obviously, the drawings and specifications. Now, although obvious, one thing I do want to point out here is that we have to read the drawings and specifications from front to back. Skimming the documents doesn't cut it. Admittedly, the specifications in particular are not only extremely boring, but they're extremely thick. Nevertheless, they're also extremely important, and we have to remember that they're written for a reason. Coordination with the soils report is frequently overlooked by both design teams and contractors. We find a lot of important information in there, like compaction percentages and what existing soil is or is not suitable for backfill. Conflicts between compaction percentages in the soils report versus the drawings are quite common. Similarly, Conflicts in aggregate base, sand, concrete, and asphalt thicknesses are also frequently found because civil engineers and landscape designers often forget to coordinate their standard details with the soils report. We also find crucial safety information in there, such as when loose sandy soils are present, which means we may need to slope the sides of our trenches back one to two in lieu of the more common one to one. This is a big safety concern and is often found to be incorrect in civil and landscape documents. The environmental survey. We need to know what contaminants are in the building, where they are, and what to keep an eye out for. Even though the owner may have their hazardous material remediation subcontractor complete all abatement work prior to the general contractor or any subcontractor stepping foot on the job site, the reality of the matter is that they miss things. It's inevitable, so we just need to deal with it. To deal with it, we need to know what to keep an eye out for during construction and alert our field crews of these potential safety issues so that they're all educated in what they need to look out for, what they need to stay away from, and, very importantly, what to do when they encounter hazardous materials. Product data. When performing a constructability review, people often just review whatever documents are handed to them. 
However, the Internet is a tremendous tool right at our fingertips and we need to use it. Virtually every manufacturer has all of their standard details right there on their websites and really easy to find. When I review a project, I'll typically end up with at least a 3-inch stack of manufacturer's details and product data that I've printed out and reviewed. We learn a lot from manufacturer's details and product data, including conflicts between their details and the drawings, and things that are missing from the drawings. Any and all other available documents. Now this may include the site logistics plans, design criteria provided by the owner to the design team, conditions of approval issued by the city, the environmental impact report, the lead checklist, or a myriad of other documents. Now, although some of these documents may appear routine and mundane, they do exist for a purpose and are part of a thorough constructability review. There are two basic methodologies to a constructability review. It might be performed by a single person, which is obviously when one person gets a set of documents and sits in a quiet room all by themselves for a significant amount of time analyzing the project. Now, I want to point out that although this may be a very lonesome approach, it's also a very effective approach. Or the review might be performed by a team of multiple people. Particularly when very little time is allowed for the review, a set of drawings will be pulled apart and each design discipline handed to a different person to go off on their own to review. Now, there are benefits and drawbacks to each of these approaches, and typically the benefit to one approach is a drawback to the other. A tremendous benefit of reviews performed by a single person is found in the thoroughness of the interdisciplinary aspect of the review. Because this person is reviewing all of the different design disciplines, they are much more prone to identify interdisciplinary conflicts, such as structural beams conflicting with ductwork, or underground utilities conflicting with footings, or sloping pipes above the ceiling that conflict with ceiling heights. Notably, many of the larger change order issues throughout the industry are the result of interdisciplinary conflicts. This is an important issue, and we'll get into this more in just a few moments when we go through the review process. A drawback to the single-person approach is, of course, the lack of individual experts for each design discipline. A benefit to the team approach is that it allows the assignment of personnel with specific expertise in each of the design disciplines. But, we of course need to be able to find these people who have the time available to perform a thorough review. Obviously, finding a team of experts who all have time on their hands can be very challenging. A drawback to this approach is that each individual expert tends to have tunnel vision on their own set of drawings and allocated spec sections, which detracts from the interdisciplinary aspect of the review. This is a big drawback, as the biggest change order issues are usually associated with conflicts between the various design disciplines. Now, these two methodologies are clearly two very different schools of thought. The simple fact is that the single-person method works best for some project teams, while the multiple-person approach is preferred by other project teams. Use the method that best suits your project team and the specific personnel that you have available to perform the review. Okay, let's talk about the phases of a constructability review and what level of detail we should get into at each design milestone. Conceptual and schematic designs are often just a handful of sheets. At this stage we are just reviewing the basic design to be sure the design is feasible and we're looking for value engineering opportunities. We may not have many comments at this point and they might all be VE ideas. At the 50% DD stage, we are still just making sure the design is feasible and looking for VE opportunities. Again, at this stage, we may not have many comments. At the 100% DD stage, the project is starting to take shape, but it's lacking details. At this point, we want to be good and sure the design is feasible, as we won't want to make major changes after this point. At this stage, we can begin our list of obscure, easy-to-miss details. These are details we see are necessary, but are somewhat obscure and would be easy for the design team to overlook during the CD phase. I call this the friendly reminder checklist. At this stage, the bulk of the comments are likely to be VE ideas and these friendly reminders. At the 50% CD milestone, the constructability review becomes more serious. At this design milestone, many of the details will be complete and the intricacies of the project will become increasingly evident. At this stage, we will thoroughly review all of the details that are in fact complete and be as thorough as possible with our friendly reminder list of obscure, easy-to-miss details. When to perform the final comprehensive constructability review requires a project-specific judgment call. If we begin the review too early, the drawings won't be far enough along for this intensive review. But, if we begin the review too late, it's likely to impact the project schedule. I generally prefer to begin the review at about the 90-95% to CD stage. This seems to be about as early as feasible with regard to completeness of the drawings, 
but not so late that the schedule is negatively affected. But again, this will require a project-specific judgment call, so use your expertise to determine when the appropriate time to commence the final comprehensive constructability review is for your project. Let's talk about the top five rules of an efficient and effective constructability review. We'll run through these five rules, then discuss each of them in greater detail. Rule number one, follow the construction process. As a general rule of thumb, the constructability review process will follow the same sequence as the building process. Start with the earthwork, then the foundations, then the superstructure, and so on. Rule number two, review the interface of various systems. Although the majority of comments are usually found within the work of a single subcontract trade, the bigger, more complicated, and more costly problems are generally found between the work of two different trades. Rule number three, avoid exhaustive lists of the obvious. This is especially true of preliminary reviews. We need to avoid presenting the design team with a long list of things they already know. Rule number four, stay focused on the important items. If a comment will not affect the cost, quality, or schedule of a project, and isn't something the contractor absolutely needs to know to perform his work, then it shouldn't be on the list. And finally, rule number five, allocate enough time for a complete review. This is where many constructability reviews fall short. Complete reviews can take from a few weeks to a few months, depending on the size of the project. For instance, a $30 million project might take a few weeks to complete the review, while a $500 million job might take a couple of months. Finding this time may not be easy, but it's crucial to a well-run project. Okay, now we'll discuss each of these rules in more detail. Of course, we'll start with rule number one, follow the construction process. Build the project. Do not focus solely on finding the problems. Only by taking the time to walk through the construction process step by tedious step are the problems going to be discovered. We need to avoid viewing a constructability review as an exercise in simply flipping through the construction documents with a focus on finding the problems. Because, quite simply, the problems are not just going to jump out at us. Start with the foundations and work your way up. Again, starting at the front sheet and flipping sheet by sheet to the last sheet won't help find the problems. For example, we need to review the foundations. Do we know the size and configuration of all the rebar? For the dowels to the concrete columns, do we have the size and lap lengths? For the concrete columns, do we know the size and quantity of the rebar verts and ties? Now I could go on all day like this, but I think this is far enough along to illustrate the tedious level of detail that's necessary for a thorough review. Follow the building envelope from the underslab membrane, up the sides of the building, and over the roof. We have to examine the construction of every intersection, angle, corner, nook, and cranny around the entire building. Verify that we know how every element comes together, and, of course, that the way each element is designed to come together does in fact work as designed. Follow each MEP system. Follow the pipe runs, and pay special attention to the drainage slopes. Are any of the pipe slopes conflicting with ceiling heights, ductwork, or maybe even structural beams? Follow the duct runs. Do we have enough clearance between the ceiling and beams for ducts to pass? Is all the piping shown? Water connections to peripheral items like refrigerators with ice makers, hot drink vending machines, and hard pipe coffee makers in the break rooms are commonly missed. Do we have power everywhere we need it? Power for miscellaneous items like irrigation controllers and chilled water drinking fountains are also commonly missed. There are two natural orders that will impact the sequence of your review. First, the sequence of construction. Generally, the logical sequence of construction aligns pretty closely with the logical sequence of a constructability review. This is a good rule of thumb, but not a steadfast rule. Secondly, the design precedence. In other words, in the event of a conflict, which system will take precedence? This is sort of a construction version of rock, paper, scissors. For example, a structural element will usually take precedence over an architectural element, while an architectural element will usually take precedence over a mechanical element. Of course, each situation is unique, so please remember that these are just rules of thumb. Let's go over an example of applying these two principles, and we'll discuss how to develop an efficient and effective method for your reviews. Now, different things work for different people. So with this in mind, I encourage everyone to develop their own process and perform reviews in a sequence that works best for you. But I do want to provide an example here. So let's go through the method I use. You might want to follow my lead, or maybe this just helps your thought process in developing your own personal style. 
I start with the building structure. I conceptually build the project in my mind and with lots of notes and hand sketches all over the drawings. From the foundation to the roof, I visualize every step. Everything starts with the structure, so keep in mind the design precedence. If there's a conflict between the structurals and any architectural, MEP, or other element, the structural typically gets priority. So, by starting with the structurals, I'm starting with the first thing we build and with the element that has physical precedence over all other elements. The exterior skin construction follows closely behind structural and is also the next logical review step. Once I've conceptually built the structure and dried in the building, I review the interior construction. Walls, ceilings, casework, and all the other various interior finishes. Here's where I jump out of sequence. During construction, the MEP rough end goes ahead of the interior architectural work. However, the design precedence generally places interior architectural as a higher importance than the MEP systems. Further, I prefer to review the MEP systems after the interior build-out work because after learning the inside of the building, I have a better understanding of what the MEP systems are serving and what they need to do. I've learned where all the rooms are, what they're for, where the chases are, and have a good overall feel for the building. It's best to have a good understanding of what the MEP systems are serving in order to thoroughly understand the MEP systems themselves. I review site work last simply because it's outside the building and is essentially isolated from the building itself. For the purpose of a constructability review, site work is for the most part a standalone phase. A big reason I do site work last is because it's generally constructed last. Thus, for a fast track project, the design team is going to want the structural, envelope, architectural, and MEP comments before the site work comments. So hitting this element last benefits the design schedule. Now many of you will follow my lead and others will use a variation of this sequence, but I do hope that sharing my personal approach here helps you figure out what works best for you individually. Okay, let's move on to rule number two. Rule number two, review the interface of various systems. Whether it be interior, exterior, structural, or MEP, the more costly problems are not discovered nearly as frequently within the body of a system as they are at the perimeter of a system where it interfaces with the various adjacent systems. This is why an interdisciplinary review is of paramount importance. First, let me define what I mean by the perimeter of a system and interfacing another system. These terms describe where the work of one trade attaches to or abuts the work of another trade, such as where a brick wall meets a storefront, or where roofing intersects and seals to a steel roof platform, or where a pipe penetrates a below-grade waterproofing membrane, or where an electrical connection is made to an air handling unit. These are all examples of the work of two different trades coming together. On the contrary, these terms would not describe conditions such as a duct tying into an air handler unit, or a plaster wall transitioning to a plaster soffit, as these are the intersections within the work of a single trade. Okay, let's look at the root of interdisciplinary issues. Each member of a design team is an expert at their respective design discipline, but they are not experts in other design disciplines. This lack of expertise isn't by any means a negative attribute of any design team member. In fact, it's exactly why we have so many individual experts from architectural to civil to structural to electrical. Each and every one of these design specialties takes a tremendous amount of knowledge, so much so that no one could ever become an expert in all of them. There just flat out isn't enough time in a person's life to become an expert at everything. However, this complexity is also what makes design coordination so difficult. Each member of a design team has an intimate knowledge of their own design, but they have only a cursory knowledge of the design work performed by the other design team members. Each architect, engineer, and other designer works day in and day out on their portion of the design work, but naturally they have very little time to spend reviewing the work of the other design team members. Design coordination meetings might be held every week or two for a couple hours, but this is only enough time to provide the team with a brief summary of what each firm is working on. This brevity is one reason that many interdisciplinary issues are just simply overlooked during the design process. Building information modeling is a tremendous resource that makes all of our jobs easier and helps identify a lot of design conflicts. But it does have its limitations. Let me preface this discussion by pointing out that although I want to spend a moment discussing the limitations of BIM and why BIM technology doesn't replace the need for a thorough constructability review, I want to be sure that I'm not misunderstood. I am a huge proponent of modeling software. 
It is a great resource, but what I want to illustrate here is why we still need to perform a thorough constructability review. Computer technology is great, but it isn't the end-all be-all of project planning. Each and every construction project is unique, will entail its own unique challenges, and require its own unique and creative solutions. Okay, let's move on. The general building design may be developed in a 3D model, but the design team's detailing work is still completed in 2D. This is for both ease of design and clarity, which is perfectly fine in a very efficient design method. It's actually the preferred design method. A project requires a lot of detailing, which is why a set of drawings is so thick. Now if we try to jam all of that detailed information into a single building model, it would be completely unreadable. Just a solid blob of overwritten information. However, the vast majority of constructability issues are discovered in coordinating the individual details with the rest of the project, including coordination of the details with the general information that's in the model. Obviously, building elements will not appear in the model unless they are intentionally added to it. A huge part of a constructability review is identification of elements that are missing from the design documents. But just like 2D drawings, a model obviously won't include things that are overlooked by the design team and just plain missing. We need to find those items the old-fashioned way by rolling up our sleeves and performing a thorough constructability review. Let's quickly run through some examples of what will not be found in a building model. But before I go through these items, I should point out that this training addresses contract documents. Notably, the models that are being created by the more sophisticated design-build subcontractors these days are in fact beginning to show high levels of detail. Nevertheless, these items that I'm about to go through still hold true with regard to the typical models being provided by design teams. A building model just won't go into enough detail to show the flashings or secondary membrane like building paper. We rely on 2D details for those smaller building elements. Sealants. Again, models just don't get anywhere near this level of detail. Structural connections. Beams and columns will be on the model, but the steel connections won't be and those connections are often found to be in conflict with other building elements. The model won't even show gusset plates, much less bolts and welds. Base plates and anchor bolts will not be in the model. Now I'm not just talking about the structural steel here. We may find base plates and their respective anchor bolts for items such as coiling door support steel that are sticking out the bottom of a stud wall. Or we may find bolt heads for a steel canopy that are sticking out the face of plaster. Roofing details. Roof penetrations, parapet cap details, equipment pads, and other important waterproofing details will not be found in the building model. Miscellaneous metals. We won't usually find support steel for coiling doors, counter support brackets, or other miscellaneous steel components in the model. Branch electrical circuits. We might have the major conduit racks, but putting all the branch electrical into a model is way more trouble than it's worth. Below grade waterproofing is not usually found on the models. Site work is not typically addressed with BIM. Models typically only show the building elements because expanding to show the grading, sidewalks, and planting would be much more effort than it's worth. Shoring and underpinning. In particular, the important coordination between these temporary construction measures and the below grade waterproofing system will typically be found in the 2D details, not the model. These are just a few examples of building components that we commonly have constructability issues with but aren't addressed in a building model. Again, please don't get me wrong. Computerized models are a spectacular resource and really help solve a lot of problems. The point I want to get across here is simply that we cannot rely on them for everything. BIM does help eliminate problems, which makes our review efforts a bit easier, but a model is not a substitute for a thorough constructability review. All in all, a computer is no match for the human brain. Rule number three, avoid an exhaustive list of the obvious. This is particularly important for preliminary reviews. Preliminary reviews must be efficient and effective design resources that help, not hinder, the design process. When performing a constructability review on 50, 75, or even 90% CDs, we need to be cognizant that the design documents are not yet complete and avoid presenting the design team with a long and exhaustive list of things they already know aren't done. Preliminary reviews should focus on general design approaches, correcting items that have in fact been completed, and identifying the obscure, easy-to-miss details. For a preliminary review, pointing out obscure, easy-to-miss issues are always welcome comments. For instance, 
Flagging items like the water connection to a coffee maker in a break room is a friendly reminder of an item that could easily be overlooked. However, for let's say a 50% CD review, don't have 50 different comments noting electrical circuits that aren't labeled yet, or 50 different comments for rooms where the flooring isn't identified in the finish schedule yet. Of course these things aren't done yet. The drawings are only at 50%. Presenting long lists of obvious items consumes the design team's time that could be better spent cranking out design work. I cannot stress the importance of this more heavily, so let me say it again. Presenting long lists of obvious items consumes the design team's time that could be better spent cranking out design work. Rule number four, focus on the important items. Before posing a comment, ask yourself four questions. Does it affect cost? Does it affect schedule? Does it affect quality? Will the contractor require this information to perform their work? Questions that fall into this fourth category might include missing dimensions or missing detail references. If the answer to any of these questions is yes, pose the comment. Otherwise, do not pose the comment. If the answer to all four of these questions is no, posing the comment will consume the design team's time that could be better spent cranking out design work. Comments that do not satisfy at least one of these four questions are always considered to be counterproductive. Avoid posing comments based on personal preferences or opinions. Remember, this is the design team's job. It's their building, their design, and the owner hired them for their expertise. If you would choose different paint colors than they did, let it go. That's a personal opinion and not a good constructability review comment. A constructability review is a review of the nuts and bolts of a project. We're not designing the project or picking out colors. The purpose of a constructability review is to be sure the project can be built with a proper balance of the least cost, the shortest amount of time, and the highest quality. Rule number five, allocate enough time for a complete review. Now this is where many constructability reviews fall short. Just because the review process, which includes incorporating solutions into the drawings and specs, won't be complete in time for bidding, doesn't mean it isn't worth doing. A thorough review will take weeks or even months for larger projects, but for every hour spent at the front end of a project, the hours saved down the road are exponential. Let's talk briefly about the differences in timing for a constructability review on private versus public works projects. A final review is typically performed at about the 90-95% to CD milestone. For privately funded projects with a negotiated prime contract, you probably still won't have enough time to perform the review and incorporate all the comments into the documents in time for bidding, even when the general contractor has been brought on board early. But, you should be able to finish incorporating the comments before the bidding process is over and subcontracts have been awarded. The four, six, or more weeks that the bidding process takes may allow sufficient time to get the comments addressed in the documents, at which point a late addendum is issued. Now, this isn't by any means ideal, but it is realistic. By addressing the comments before subcontracts are awarded, we can issue an addendum to attain pricing while still in the competitive bidding phase, which is when, to be blunt, the most honest pricing is going to be attained. In other words, we'll get the price revisions while the bidders are still using their, quote, bid rates, not their, quote, change order rates. Of course, on hard bid projects, we don't have this luxury of time because bid day is, for all intents and purposes, the same day subcontract values are finalized. Nevertheless, in the case of a hard bid or any other type of project, it is still better to find and address the problems early. Realistically, thorough reviews cannot always be complete and incorporated into the design documents before subcontract values are finalized. But, that doesn't detract from the importance of addressing the problems early in a project. Regardless of contract type, the following holds true. The earlier problems are discovered, the earlier they can be resolved. The earlier problems are resolved, the less chance they will have a cost or schedule impact. Just because we don't take the time to perform a constructability review at the onset of a project doesn't mean we'll have fewer problems to deal with or fewer change orders. Problems don't go away just because we don't look for them. In fact, it means we'll have more change orders and more delays because the problems will be discovered as the project progresses, usually at the last minute. It's better to issue an updated set of documents even two months after subcontracts are finalized and deal with the change order issues early on in one fell swoop than it is to sit back and wait for the problems to pop up one by one through the course of construction. Okay, 
That wraps up the top five rules for an efficient and effective constructability review. Now let's talk about how to put a review together and manage the process. Accuracy and good organization of review comments are crucial to managing the process. To be perfectly honest and realistic, constructability reviews that are inaccurate and or poorly organized can be a complete waste of time because they aren't viewed by the design team as professional or even credible. Always employ a system of checks and balances. For instance, when I perform a review, I always take two passes through the documents. First, I review the drawings, specs, and other documents like the soils report and make handwritten notes all through them. Second, I go back through all of my notes to log the comments into the written report, which is done with a plain and simple Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. This second pass is a good way to back check my comments because after reviewing all of the documents, I am much more educated on the project, which helps ensure the comments are as accurate and complete as possible. Comments should always be organized in a manner that is easily sortable. Naturally, spreadsheets work best for this. That's plain and simple, but let's discuss a detrimental shortcut that I see people take time and time again. Logging the comments is tedious and takes a lot of time. So when faced with a time crunch, many people will take a shortcut by simply marking up the drawings and specs with handwritten comments, then dropping their big pile of scribbled notes on the architect's desk. This is a very bad practice for many reasons, but I'll just address the two biggest reasons here. Handwritten notes are chicken scratch. During a review, we are constantly writing and sketching all over the drawings. If you're not covering the drawings with notes, you're probably not performing a thorough review. It's not a reasonable expectation for a design team to sort through your thousands of scattered notes to identify which are valid comments and which are just your own notes. Remember, a constructability review needs to be an efficient and effective tool for use by the entire design team. It needs to be summarized and organized in an efficient manner. It is virtually impossible to keep track of comments when they're scattered sporadically through thousands of pages of drawings, specifications, and other contract documents. This is a big one. I really can't emphasize this enough. When we present our comments to the design team, we need a method of tracking the issues. We need an itemized list so we can close items as they are completed and sort the list for open items. Hundreds of comments come from a constructability review and we absolutely have to have a manageable method of tracking them. Logging comments into a spreadsheet and organizing them takes time, but making this effort is of paramount importance. Posing a comment to the design team within a stack of marked up drawings does absolutely no good if the comment is never read, misinterpreted, or just plain forgotten about. Again, I really can't stress this enough. A constructability review can be a waste of time if not competently managed. Honestly, there are a lot of architects and engineers out there who will receive a set of marked up drawings, flip through them once, skim the various comments, and then roll the drawings up, stick them behind their desk, and never unroll them again. Efficiently and effectively managing the review comments ensures they are read, clearly understood, and properly addressed in the construction documents. This management is crucial to be sure the design team, early on, maintains full accountability for each and every problem discovered in their documents. Okay, let's next discuss the additional benefits of a constructability review. Then I'll show you an example of how I personally prepare, organize, and present review comments. The time spent performing a review does not need to be spent merely on issues that the design team will be concerned with. There are many additional benefits to a constructability review that can be had for very little extra effort. We can also identify subcontractor scope issues. This is a big one. Or as more commonly termed by general contractors, we can create the bid leveling sheets. As we're progressing step by tedious step conceptually building the project, we're not just going to discover the problems. We're going to learn everything about the project which just naturally includes identification of subcontractor scope issues. Identify trade coordination issues. Similarly, we'll naturally discover sequencing and scheduling issues throughout the constructability review process, such as where metal panels transition to plaster in an inside corner. Does the metal panel lap behind the plaster, or does the plaster lap behind the metal panel? Whatever the case may be, be sure the sequence indicated by the project schedule matches the sequence depicted in the details. In other words, with this example, determine if the schedule should show the metal panels or plaster going in first. We will also identify quality control issues. Taking a few extra moments to log these items into the quality control program is very efficient and great time management. Identify long lead items. We'll find these items we'll review in the specs and MEP equipment schedules in particular. 
This is crucial schedule information that we need to keep close track of throughout construction. So as you come across long lead items during your review, take a second to jot them down. Value engineering is another natural byproduct of a thorough review. Compile and organize an embed list. Keep a list of these as you come across them and the effort will pay off big at the onset of construction. Various concrete embeds are found sporadically throughout the documents. We'll find structural embeds in the structural drawings, embeds for the facade and random architectural details, and things like recessed door closers may only be found in the door hardware schedule. At the onset of a project, things are moving fast and furious. The PM and superintendent may be finishing up other projects while this new project is getting off the ground. The reality is that concrete is poured early in a project, but early in a project, the project manager and superintendent just haven't had enough time to thoroughly review the drawings. This lack of project-specific knowledge is why so many embeds are missed early in a construction project. Like it or not, the reality is that a superintendent isn't looking as far forward as the door hardware schedule when they're finishing up their last project and frantically trying to get concrete poured on this new project. This embed list will save a tremendous amount of concrete chipping and rework down the road. Compile and organize a backing list. Ditto everything I just said about the embed list. In-wall backing goes in quite a bit later than the embeds, but like embeds, backing is found sporadically through the drawing specs, and even the submittals. Start this log during the constructability review and keep it going through the submittal reviews. Develop an in-depth knowledge of the project. This is a big one. The person or people who spend the time doing this review are by nature spending a tremendous amount of time learning all of the intricacies of the project. The project-specific knowledge base that this develops is invaluable through the course of construction. However, and it's a big however, the person or people assigned to the review need to be experienced, such as senior superintendents or executives. It takes a seasoned builder to be able to identify and help solve problems. But, on the other hand, it's hard to get someone at this level to find the time to sit down with a set of drawings for a few weeks or even multiple months in the case of a larger project. For this reason, third-party constructability consultants are often employed to ensure that a professional, experienced person is assigned to the review and that a thorough, complete review is done. Okay, now let's take a look at an example of how I personally prepare and organize a constructability review. You may follow my lead, use a slight variation of my example, or come up with a completely different format. But nevertheless, I hope sharing this helps you develop your own individual method that works best for you and the project teams you work with. Here's an example of one of my personal reviews. I won't point out the obvious items, but there are a few things that I'd like to highlight. I use separate columns for the drawing sheet and detail number so we have the ability to sort the list by sheet number. This ability to group the comments is a tremendous help to the design team. For this final constructability review, there were two previous reviews at the 100% DD and 50% CD stages. So I add columns to correlate the previous item numbers with the new updated review. The design team will have added columns and notes to the previously issued reviews, so this ability to sort the columns back to their previous order makes it easy for the design team to cut and paste their notes from their copy of the previous spreadsheet. I often use the notes column to track the status of older items. For instance, during the 50% CD review, I backchecked the 100% DD comments. And subsequently, for the 95% CD review, I backchecked both the 50% CD comments and, for a second time, the 100% DD comments that were still open. By using a spreadsheet, more columns can be added by the architect, owner, and subconsultants for their responses, action items, and even a column that assigns each comment to a specific team member, which is highly recommended. You'll notice by the multiple tabs at the bottom of the spreadsheet that I separate the review into multiple sections. I found this greatly improves the organization of the comments. This first section is comprised of comments with a potential cost impact. These are the bigger issues. The second section is similar to the first. It's primarily comprised of comments with a cost impact, but I use this section to segregate the waterproofing issues simply due to their high importance. Design teams, contractors, and owners always seem to appreciate having waterproofing issues highlighted in their own section. The third section contains value engineering suggestions, which is pretty self-explanatory. The fourth section is for what I call general document comments. These are the issues we need to know, but are less likely to affect the cost of the project. For instance, missing dimensions or minor quality control suggestions would be found in this section. The reason I prefer to segregate these comments from the cost-related comments in sections 1 and 2 is both for presentation and to help the design team prioritize their work. For instance, 
In a time crunch, the design team may only have enough time to incorporate the additions and revisions associated with sections 1, 2, and hopefully 3 in time for inclusion in the bid documents. They would then incorporate the section 4 comments for issuance after bidding is complete, and hopefully this later revision will have little or no cost impact. This sort of segregation isn't absolutely necessary, but i found that architects, engineers, contractors, and owners all seem to appreciate it. This fifth section is where I keep track of backing and embeds. Now, I don't list out every single piece of backing or itemize all the embeds here. That would be too exhaustive and really unnecessary for the purpose of a constructability review. This list simply flags backing and embeds for the general contractor, who will then use that list to compile their own complete and comprehensive backing and embed plans. I provide a description and detail reference simply as a reminder to the general contractor not to forget these items. This is an excellent additional benefit to the constructability review process. Again, as we go through the drawings conceptually building the project, we find the obscure backing and embeds, so at that point it really doesn't take much effort to simply type them into this log. It takes little effort to do and is a tremendous benefit to the contractor. You might even add more sections to your review template, such as a list of long lead items. This is my method and it works very well. You're welcome to replicate my approach, alter it to suit your own preferences, or just use what I presented here for brainstorming purposes to help you develop your own individual methodology. What you see here in the second spreadsheet is a basic version of the general contractor's bid leveling sheets. There is a different tab for each subtrade, which makes it very easy to log not only scope issues, but also quality control concerns as well. When you go about the review process of conceptually building the project, these scope and quality control issues are found naturally, so it's just a matter of logging them into a simple spreadsheet like this. This is another great example of killing multiple birds with the same stone. Getting multiple benefits out of a single effort is a textbook example of good time management and an efficient workflow. Okay, now let's talk about the top five barriers to a successful constructability review. Number one, experienced personnel aren't available. An experienced person is an executive or senior superintendent, but those guys can't typically set aside their other responsibilities to study a set of drawings for an extended period of time. You could take the team approach and divvy up the review by having different design disciplines reviewed by different people, or you could employ a third-party consultant to perform the review. But the choices of shortcutting the review or not performing the review at all are obviously never recommended. Number two, not enough time is allowed. Owners are notorious for such phrases as, here are the drawings, give me your comments in three days. These types of statements are from owners who haven't gone through a thorough constructability review before and quite simply don't understand why providing comments should take any more than a few days. This is a huge challenge, but don't just tell the owner that's not enough, I need five weeks. He won't understand and he'll probably get mad at you. Let the owner know that the constructability review you perform is very thorough and request that he spend about 15 or 20 minutes with you to discuss the process. Unless this is your first thorough review, you should always show the owner an example of one that you've done in the past. An example is always the best way to get the point across. If this is your first thorough review, and don't be ashamed, there's a first time for all of us, you might want to show him this video. Let him know that you'll be going through this comprehensive process, and hopefully the owner will really appreciate the effort and understand. This can be a tough discussion, but it's also a very necessary discussion. Depending on the relationship, it might even be a discussion that's best suited for one of your executives to have with the owner. Number three, allowing the review process to become an administrative nightmare. Keep your comments clear, concise, and efficient. If you see 75 diffusers that aren't coordinated between the mechanical drawings and the architectural reflected ceiling plans, it's clear this coordination hasn't been done yet. Just make one comment, not 75. Be sure the comments are logged into a spreadsheet, not just handwritten notes all over a set of drawings. Now, some might want to review the drawings on a computer and type comments all over them because that makes them look prettier than the handwritten comments, but tracking those issues is an equally unrealistic task. Post comments, not questions. Comments should not ask questions like, please confirm if we have a detail for condition X. It is the reviewer's responsibility to review the drawings and determine what is and isn't there. If a thorough job of reviewing the documents is done, the reviewer will be able to make definitive comments and not pose questions to the design team. Don't take shortcuts like this. Finally, and this is a big one, encourage the design team to respond to comments by making the corrections and additions to the drawings 
as opposed to spending needless hours providing written responses to each and every comment. This is a time-consuming, non-productive administrative exercise that I see design teams do time and time again. Let me say that again. Encourage the design team to respond to comments by making the corrections and additions to the drawings, as opposed to spending needless hours providing written responses to each and every comment. This is a time-consuming, non-productive administrative exercise that I see design teams doing time and time again. The time spent providing those written responses would be time better spent cranking out design work. Stay efficient and stay productive. Number four, writing comments in an aggressive tone which causes the design team to become defensive. Egos have no place in the constructability review process. Just as an architect shouldn't scold the general contractor for having punch list items left at the end of a project, general contractors should not scold design teams for problems discovered during the constructability review. Problem solving is a natural aspect of the construction process and we all need to accept that. Comments should be written in a polite tone and the word please should be found frequently. When comments are posed in snide or condescending manners, the design team members become defensive and we lose a great deal of team collaboration. When done properly, the constructability review process can actually be a team building exercise. But when done poorly, it can also be divisive to the team. Number five, failing to follow through the process until all issues are successfully resolved. This is huge. Don't just hand the comments to the design team and assume that they'll all be taken care of. Discuss progress during the weekly project team meetings and be sure good progress is being made every week. You should also designate someone to be responsible for back-checking the documents to verify that all items are resolved. And the person that's assigned to this management task should not be from the architect staff. It should be an unbiased, non-design team member, usually someone from the general contractor staff or the construction manager. Okay. That brings our presentation to an end. I hope you're all able to walk away more knowledgeable about this process and that you'll be able to take the leadership position on the constructability review for your next project. Thank you.